So firstly, thank you guys so much for allowing me to the opportunity to, to speak to you today. It's uh, very interesting to be able to come to a seminar without actually leaving my house. Um, this is the new world that we're in, but we're all getting used to it. So uh, my name is David Scanlon. I'm a professor at the chemistry department at UCL, but I'm also a joint appointment at Diamond Light Source. And Diamond Light Source is the UK's national synchrotron. Um, I'm a, so today I'm gonna to talk about computationally driven design of new and improved transparent conducting oxides. So at UCL, I lead the materials theory group and we've grown quite rapidly since I started the group in 2014. We currently have about 29 members. This is a picture of them enjoying our Christmas party. Um, not all computational chemists are kept in a dungeon. I let these out occasionally to go for a few drinks. Um, but the overarching uh, research aims in our group are looking at structure property relationships in the solid state. And we normally apply these to systems that are of interest for renewable energy applications. So we look at solar cell materials, we look at thermoelectrics, we're heavily funded for batteries at the moment because the UK is moving towards the electrification of vehicles. Um, and we're also very interested in transparent conducting oxides. Now, transparent conducting oxides were something that I started studying during my PhD. So they've really been the research love of my life, um, and I still haven't figured them out yet. But as you're going to see in this talk, we still are finding new and interesting insights into materials that have been known for decades. Um, and there's still new directions and new ways we can go to make these materials better. So why are we interested in transparent conducting oxides? Well, they're literally everywhere. You have applications in touchscreen, uh, so your, your phone, your iPhone, or whatever your device you're watching this on probably has a screen with a transparent conducting oxide in it. So you have them in liquid crystal displays, touch screens, low emissivity glass, and also they're part of every single solar cell. No matter what the solar cell architecture, there's more than likely a transparent conducting oxide in your solar cell, which is going to allow light through into your absorber, and also it acts as an electron transport layer. So how do they work? Well, the materials are optically transparent, so you have an optical band gap bigger than 3.1 electron volts, so if light is shone on your material, it will not excite an electron from the valence band to the conduction band, so light will simply pass through. And normally these are oxide systems which are figure or feature post-transition metal cations, so you have zinc, two plus oxide with a 3.4 eV um, optical band gap, tin dioxide with a 4.2 eV optical band gap, and indium oxide with a 3.75 eV optical band gap. So generally you uh, would like your system to have a very, very dispersed conduction band minimum, uh, shown here in red, a large separation between the valence band and the conduction band, and when you donor dope these systems, you would like your donors to be as close to the conduction band minimum as possible so that you can get high levels of conductivity. So for really excellent transparent conducting oxides, when you dope the system with extra electrons, the extra electrons actually occupy the bottom of the conduction band and they fill it up, up as far as the Fermi level. And this essentially opens up the optical band gap um, giving you increased optical transparency. You have a second caveat, which is that once you have these electrons occupying the bottom of the conduction band, they can then be excited by visible light into lower lying conduction bands. So what you also like is to have a large separation of about 3.1 electron volts between the Fermi energy and the next lowest conduction band so that once these materials are actually defective and conducting, you don't end up losing transparency. So typically they display very good conductivities. So carrier concentrations are normally greater than 10 to the 20 and conductivities as high as 10 to the four. So if you remember the conductivity of most metals is about 10 to the six. So this is an order of magnitude or two lower than the conductivity of a metal, but still massively high. Um, and this is a picture I like to show undergrads when I'm teaching them. On the left, we had a concert when I was uh, young. And on the right, we have a concert now. So people used to dance, but now what they do is they go and film on their devices. And every single one of these devices contains a transparent conducting oxide and also normally contains a lithium ion battery. So it's good for advertising my battery research as well. So 
how do we control conductivity in transparent conducting oxides? Well, obviously we do it by controlling defects, be they intrinsic or extrinsic. And we characterize the type of defects that you have in the system into three different characterizations. You have deep defects, which are greater than 0.03 of an electron volt or greater than KT away from the band edge. So basically they need to be heated to be optic or to be excited thermally into the conduction band. We have shallow defects, which are ones that are within 0.03 electron volts, meaning that they can easily be excited at room temperature. Or we have ones which are resonant. These are the ones we really want where you're actually directly injecting your donors into the bottom of the conduction. Band. So for N-type TCOs, which the majority of um, industrial transparent conducting oxides are, you ha either have oxygen vacancies or cation interstitials, or you have extrinsic donor dopants. So generally when trying to make a new transparent conducting oxide, you want to avoid materials where p-type defects are present in high concentrations, because these defects will simply um, kill your uh, electrons. And you also really have to have a massively big dispersion of your conduction band minimum. So you want good curvature of the bands, which is going to be vital for mobility of the charge carriers. So we spent the last, say, 10 years working on the defect chemistry of um, transparent conducting oxides. And just when we thought that we kind of understood everything in terms of how both N-type and P-type systems work, um, in the last, say, four years, we've stumbled upon a new type of doping regime, which I'm going to explain in the second half of this talk. So when we look at the typical band structures of the um, N-type transparent conducting oxides, you can see that they all have very dispersive conduction band minima. So you can see the band structures here for indium oxide, tin dioxide, zinc oxide, and barium stannate. And they all have very curvy conduction bands, which are given in orange. And generally their valence bands are relatively flat. They have low effective masses of the um, the conduction band minimum, meaning that you, sh if you can donor dope them, you'll get high uh, mobility. But not all of them have a very wide fundamental band gap. And this is not always necessary because as you can find donors which can inject electrons directly into the conduction band, you can open up what's known as the moss burstein shift here, basically doping a material that is not transparent when undoped to become transparent when it is doped. So the global TCO market is basically dominated by indium containing systems. Um, and the TCO market is massive. It's going to uh, supposedly going to grow to 8.04 uh, billion in 2020. And currently tin doped indium oxide, which we know as ITO, or amorphous indium gallium zinc oxide, IGZO, are the ones that dominate the transparent display and transparent thin film transistor industries. So ITO continues to account for basically more than 60% of the transparent conductor market and most of the global indium use. The main issue with this is that as the uh, indium demand is rising and there's a small problem that indium is normally available in places that we would describe as geopolitically unstable, which means that historically indium prices have really been volatile. And one of the issues with this is that if you're an industrial company and you're trying to set your um, profit targets for the year, it's very easy if you know that maybe the price of indium will rise steadily over the next five to 10 years. But if you're dealing with something that's going to be going up and down and you can't really forecast it, then that's not ideal. So what that has meant is that the, the field has really started to look for materials that um, could replace indium-based transparent conducting oxides. And that's one of the, the strands of research that we do here in London. So when trying to design new or improved transparent conducting oxides, there's a couple of open questions. The first one is, are there alternatives out there that we just haven't discovered yet? Can we find new transparent conducting oxides with similar properties to the ones we already know? Or are we actually maxing out the performance of the current TCOs? So what can we do to make current TCOs better? So in our lab, we've got a couple of different ways of looking at this. The first one is we're trying to identify alternative wide band gap systems and um, to see if we can find new TCOs. 
But the other one is we want to look for what is the optimal dopant for each transparent conducting oxides, and that's something that we've spent a long time doing for the last four or five years. So the first part of my talk is going to be looking at alternative wideband gap oxides, and then I'm going to turn to the second part, which will be looking at novel doping strategies. So if we look at the chemical history of transparent conducting oxides, the first transparent conducting oxide ever was cadmium oxide, founded in 1907 by Karl Badecker in Germany. Um, and basically, as we said previously, there are all these post-transition metal cations. So the common trend is that you have this N minus one, D10, NS0, NP0 uh, electronic structure. Um, and what these give you is when you have these in an oxide material, you get the low-lying metal S states interacting strongly with the oxygen 2P states, giving you very strong orbital overlap, which gives you that really nice dispersion of the conduction band minimum. So if we're trying to find alternatives, we just simply have to turn towards the um, periodic table. And you can see in red, we have the typical cations that we normally know and love. Um, but if we go one to the right in the periodic table, we will find antimony and bismuth. Now, antimony and bismuth normally occur in the three plus oxidation state, and that's where they are most stable. But they are and can be stabilized in the five plus oxidation state. And when they're five plus, they have the exact same electronic structure and electronic configuration as all of these other cations. Another motivation is that antimony five is far cheaper than either tin or indium. Uh, these materials should have large electron affinities, meaning that they should be easy to dope. You should get smallish conduction band minimums um, or smallish conduction band effective masses, meaning that it should have reasonably high um, mobility. And also you should have largish band gaps, meaning that they could be transparent to visible light. So the first material that we looked at was SP205 as the parent material for an SP5 plus containing system. Um, but what we found is by going through the literature, we found that Martin Janssen, a very famous solid state chemist, had made this material in 1978 and solved the crystal structure, and the crystal structure is shown here. Um, I asked the experimental chemists, we have a number of solid state chemists in UCL chemistry department, would they make this system for me? Because I had some predictions. Um, and they said that the method that Professor Janssen had used to make this system was one that nobody uh, in the chemistry department would ever be allowed to try because it would be too dangerous. So that put paid to that. But we could still go on and do some calculations. And the first thing we could do was calculate the electronic structure. And you can automatically see that it has a large fundamental band gap. It has a very good um, curvature of the conduction band minimum. It has a large separation between the conduction band minimum and the next lowest conduction band, meaning that it has everything that you would expect for a new transparent conducting oxide. The conduction band minimum effective mass is about 0.35, which is very small, indicating high mobility. Um, and we actually went and did some doping studies, understanding how different dopants would uh, affect the defect chemistry. And we found that similar to doping of tin dioxide, if you put fluorine on an oxygen site, it should act as a shallow donor, meaning that actually SP205 would be an amazing transparent conducting oxide if you could actually make it. So if, that is a, if there's anyone in the audience who really wants to have a go at making SP205 and doping it, then I, I would be very, very keen to work with them because I really think this would be an, an excellent system. So because we couldn't work on the SP205 system, we started to think about are there ternary systems where we could stabilize antimony 5 plus? So simply looking at the uh, inorganic crystal structure database, you could find 48 materials that are ternaries containing antimony in the 5 plus oxidation state. And we could automatically reduce that by removing transition metals because transition metals would end up um, reducing our transparency and also removing mercury because we didn't really want to play around with that. So that left 27 compounds that we could look at and they all have very interesting topologies of the SbO6 octahedra. So 
for example, on the top, we have a system where you'd have three-dimensional um, connectivity of the octahedra, meaning that you probably have three-dimensional pathways for electrons to move in this system. On the bottom, we have a lovely layered system um, where you have definite, really nice two-dimensional conductivity. So you're probably looking at something that would have anisotropic conductivity, but could be useful for different niche um, uh, applications. So what we did was we calculated the um, stability of all of these 27 um, candidate materials against all elemental, binary, and ternary competing phases at two levels of theory, PB sol, which is a GGA functional, and PB zero, which is a hybrid functional and should give you better electronic structure. Um, and we found that all of them are actually stable. So there's none of these materials are metastable materials. These are thermodynamically stable materials um, and should be quite easily to for, easy formable. We decided to rule out the cadmium-based systems because although they showed fantastic properties, um, nobody really wants to work with cadmium at the moment either, even though cadmium oxide is probably the best TCO, but industry will never touch it. So these systems highlighted in green all have three-dimensional connectivity of the octahedra, meaning that they should be good conductors in all three dimensions. The ones in blue all have 2D connectivity, so again, interesting for different applications. The ones in purple all have 1D connectivity, probably not as useful, but could be interesting for different types of physics or chemistry. And the one in the middle with the very faded purple actually had a 0D connectivity, um, so unlikely to be uh, conductive at all. So we decided that we'd look at this material ZNSP206 because we obviously we have a list of 27 materials that we want to get through, but we can't. It does take time to do these systems in detail. So we decided a one that looked like it would have all of the benefits of previous transparent conducting oxides, such as zinc oxide, and also the benefit of SP205. So it crystallizes in this ordered trirutal tri structure, so related to the rutal structure of um, tin dioxide or TiO2. And it had actually been first suggested as a transparent conducting oxide in 2005 by Hideo Hosono's group in Japan. And they had made some powders and played around with the oxygen partial pressure during synthesis and had basically decided that it should have worked, but it didn't. And it was likely that the defect chemistry wasn't in our favor. It had also emerged from a large scale computational screening by Jeff Hautier's group in 2014, where they calculated all of the oxides in the um, materials project database. So well, they're actually all taken from the inorganic crystal structure database. And they found that the conduction man minimum of the system is very highly dispersed and should be an interesting system um, to look at for transparent conducting oxide applications, but they never went any further than that. They just looked at the pure system. Um, and of course, Pat Woodward and uh, Hiroshi Mitsuguki were also looking at these systems around 2004, um, looking at the effect of what edge sharing or, or corner sharing octahedral have on, on um, conductivity of these types of oxides. So we calculated the electronic structure of this system and we saw immediately that we have again a lovely dispersed conduction band minimum. We have a large separation between the conduction band minimum and the lowest conduction band. Um, we have a very low conduction band effective mass of 0.23. Um, so everything that we see here shows that this material should be a good transparent conducting oxide. So of course as computational chemists we can calculate the formation energy of defects in this system. Um, and we do it using the standard methodology, which is outlined in this review, if anyone is interested in it. So you simply have the energy of the defect in the supercell with the charge state Q minus the energy of the host supercell um, times the number of species added or taken away from an external reservoir times the elemental energy and the chemical potential of the species, um, where EF is the Fermi level, which can range from the valence bond maximum to the conduction bond minimum. Uh, this is the valence bond maximum of the host, and then you apply a number of corrections to account for charge uh, cell and finite supercells. So basically the corrections we normally apply are a potential alignment correction, because if you have a defect in a supercell and then you have a charge defect in another supercell, there's no guarantee that the valence bond maximum of both of these systems will be at the same level, so we apply a potential alignment correction. 
We apply an image charge correction because if I have a charge defect in this system, because we're working in a 3D periodic uh, density functional theory code, it will interact with its neighboring image. So we have to take off that interaction. And also band filling, because we can only use supercells with say up to 100 or 150 atoms, the co concentration of dopants that we actually put into our simulations are actually quite high. Um, and this gives us um, an erroneous band filling, which we then can remove um, to bring us back to the dilute limit over here on the right. So we can calculate the, the um, thermodynamic stability of these systems um, quite easily. And we can see that ZN SP206 has a large stability field relative to its other competing phases. And we're going to present all of our defects at this um, chemical potential limit here, which is where it intersects with SP204, SP203, um, and is what you would describe as antimony um, rich and zinc rich. So very oxygen poor, so very N type in nature. So if we look at the intrinsic defects first, what we can see is that, so this is a plot of, of defect formation energy versus Fermi level. And if anyone hasn't seen these systems before, they can be very confusing the first time you see them, but they actually, there's an awful lot of information on these plots. And once you get used to them, they've kind of become the Bible that we use for selecting materials for different properties. So if a, a diagram slopes upwards to the right or a line slopes upwards to the right, this normally indicates that it's an N-type defect. And if it slopes downwards to the, to the right, then it's a P-type defect. Um, and when you start to look at the lowest energy defects, you can see that antimony on a zinc site is a low energy donor. Oxygen vacancy is slightly, is probably the lowest energy donor at the conduction band because its energy is lowest here, but it's transition level. So the donor states that you would see in something like a DLTS, deep level transient spectroscopy experiment, are very far from the conduction band minimum, meaning that you would have to give it an awful lot of energy to excite the electrons from this transition level into the conduction band. So, the main take home point is that this material is very, very weakly n-type. And if you solve um, self-consistently the formation energy of all these defects to get the position of the Fermi level, you would find that you max it out at carrier concentrations of about five times 10 to the 16. So this is probably what Professor Hosono was seeing when he was trying to um, play around with his oxygen partial pressures. He was making a weakly n-type material, but he couldn't drive it the whole way into being a degenerate n-type semiconductor. So we decided we would look at the effect of fluorine doping, because obviously fluorine is what people use to dope tin dioxide and other uh, n-type oxides. And what we found out is that fluorine is a very low energy, shallow um, defect. It injects its electron directly into the conduction band. And the fluorine interstitial is uh, not going to compensate it until far above the um, conduction band minimum, meaning that you will end up with a very good transparent conducting oxide. And similarly, aluminium, and I haven't shown on this slide, but gallium as well, are very low energy dopants. They preferentially go in on the zinc site and not on the antimony site and you end up being able to get lots of carrier concentrations into the system. And the prediction is that you should get a carrier concentration of about two times 10 to the 20, and that you will have a degenerate semiconductor with a very high conductivity. So we started to think then, we've now, we think we've predicted a new transparent conducting oxide. We think we now know what dopants to put in the system to make it a transparent conducting oxide. But is that the only application that this system might have? Is it just a transparent conducting oxide? Um, and at the, about the same time as we were doing this, my group was starting to get in, interested in thermoelectrics. And thermoelectric materials, they normally convert waste heat to usable energy. So again, very renewable energy uh, application driven. And you can describe how good uh, a material is by looking at this equation here, where ZT is the dimensionless figure of merit for a thermoelectric, um, is 
equal to alpha squared, where alpha is the Seebeck coefficient, times the conductivity times the temperature, all over the lattice thermal conductivity plus the electrical thermal conductivity. So it's quite difficult to maximize the ZT of a system because you have a number of um, interrelated systems or interrelated properties which kind of fight against one another. So as you increase your carrier concentration on the x-axis here, you can see that your conductivity will obviously go up, but also your um, total kappa, which would be the sum of K lat plus K electron, goes up because as you increase the number of charge carriers, you also increase the electrical thermal conductivity. At the same time, your alpha reduces because alpha is actually maximized by high carrier effective masses and low carrier concentrations. So you're fighting against, uh, each of these kind of properties is fighting against one another. And what you end up with is a material specific ZT. At, uh, and this is why we haven't fully cracked the, the puzzle of making the really, really super high efficient uh, thermoelectric devices yet. So ZT optimization is actually a very difficult and lengthy process. And here's a, a very nice diagram produced by Mercury, Kenneth Zetas and co-workers. Um, and in it, in green, you have P-type materials and in red, you have N-type materials. And what you can see is that there's two ceilings that used to exist. One was punching the ZT through uh, one and one was the ceiling of ZT equals two. And we have now just about punched through the ceiling of ZT equals two, and we actually have a world record of um, tin selenide, which is, I think it's 2.4 or 2.6, I can never remember. Um, but what you can see is that all of these materials that are punching through this uh, record ceiling are all P-type. N-type materials really lag behind. They're about 1.5, at best, maybe 1.6. Um, they're all containing either toxic materials like lead or rare materials like tellurium. Um, and this has made, meant that a lot of people have been very interested in trying to find oxides which would work as thermoelectrics. Now, the pros for an oxide thermoelectric are that they're cheap, earth abundant, generally non-toxic and with high stability. The cons are that really they don't work very well yet. So here we have uh, from Sylvie Her Hubert's um, review of oxide thermoelectrics. You can see that only two systems have ever punched through the ZT equals one ceiling. And these are materials that are P-type in nature. And for N-type materials, the types of systems that they actually look at are either simple perovskites like strontium titanate, or they are doped transparent conducting oxides like aluminium doped zinc oxide, germanium doped indium oxide, or um, combinations of zinc oxide and indium oxide. And these materials max out at a ZT of about 0.48. And I think the world record is about 0.65. Um, and that's in a study where people had a doped zinc oxide with aluminium and with gallium. So basically two dopants to try and reduce the lattice thermal conductivity and increase the conductivity. So the limitations for all of these systems and the reasons that they don't have a very large ZT is that they all tend to have high lattice thermal conductivity, which severely limits efficiencies. But what we as computational chemists can do is we can calculate the lattice thermal conductivity of a system using uh, PhonoPy and Phono3PY, which are two codes developed by um, Togo and Tanaka in Japan. And basically what we do is we use lattice dynamics to understand how um, the phonons behave in the system and to understand three phonon interactions, which are what normally control um, lattice thermal conductivity. And in the example here, we've shown the lattice thermal conductivity um, versus temperature for zinc oxide. And then we use that to, um, on the right, calculate uh, basically a heat map of temperature versus carrier concentration versus ZT. And we can see that for a perfect single crystal, at the very top of the temperature range, you can probably drive your uh, ZT to about 0.2 
which fits very well with experiment because all of the higher values for ZT have been uh, basically they're not uh, they're not single crystals. They are systems where you have introduced lots of defects, which reduces the lattice thermal conductivity further, giving you higher ZT values. So we were happy going forward that we knew how to calculate the lattice thermal conductivity and how to predict these um, ZTs. So of course we decided to do this for ZNSP206. So we calculated the phonon stability and we saw that it's dynamically stable and that the lattice thermal conductivity is actually significantly lower than that of zinc oxide, meaning that essentially you should be able to get a higher ZT value than people are already getting for zinc oxide. And also from just doing this analysis, we found out that if you actually nanostructure these systems, you will actually lower the lattice thermal conductivity even further. So we then plot our carrier concentration versus temperature plots for these systems. All we can see is at the top of the stability range, you should be able to drive your um, ZT to about 0.65 or 0.7. And basically, that would be a better performance than any n-type thermoelectric um, that has been found yet. Definitely higher than germanium-doped indium oxide and aluminium-doped zinc oxide. So essentially, not only have we found a new transparent conducting oxide, we believe we're on the road to finding uh, a new thermoelectric oxide, which um, is of interest for um, putting into cars immediately, actually. Um, so our conclusions for this part of the, the talk, antimony 5 based oxides are actually a valuable family of semiconducting oxides, and they have very similar properties to the current transparent conducting oxides, including large fundamental band gaps, large or similar conduction band minimum dispersion, and they have 2D or 3D connectivity of the SP06 octahedra. They have applications in TCOs. We're looking at them also for power electronics and thermoelectrics. And ZNSP206 is natively a weakly n-type system, but you can add in extrinsic donors and turn it into a degenerate transparent conducting oxide. We predict that fluorine doping and aluminium and gallium doping uh, are going to be very effective. And we have predicted that it is probably going to be the best n-type thermoelectric ever. And all of this has come simply from our calculations. So UCL is a very large university and we have a large number of people with very diverse skill sets. So we turned to our single crystal grower, Robin Perry, and his student, Ben Parrott, and they have grown single crystals undoped of ZNSP206. And at 300 Kelvin, they show resistivity of 0.01 milliohm centimeter and a mobility of about 80 centimeter squared per volt second. And that's for a carrier density of about 1.2 by 10 to the 19. So our preliminary crystal growth shows that these systems are transparent conducting oxides. Um, and we've actually, I haven't shown the data here, but we have managed to gallium dope the single crystals now. And the conductivity is basically um, down in the 10 to the minus four, fully transparent. And we are writing up the paper for uh, publication. Hopefully you might see it in a high impact journal soon, providing everything goes well. But yeah, we were very happy because we have gone the whole way from computationally suggesting something should be good to having that realized and um, actually proving us to be right. So now I'm gonna go on to the second part of my talk. And that is um, understanding better dopants for current transparent conducting oxides. So when we think of the conventional doping strategies that we use when we're designing transparent conducting oxides, you tend to take a system like tin oxide for tin dioxide and you go one to the right in the periodic table to find your new dopants. So antimony five plus sitting on the tin four plus position will add one extra donor or fluorine on the oxygen site will add an extra electron giving you um, a degenerate semiconductor. Similarly for zinc oxide, you can go one to the right to aluminium, gallium, or indium to give you extra electrons in the cation site, or you can go one to the right to fluorine. Um, but is this actually the optimal way to dope, or is this just something that we have known for years from, say, 
our understanding of silicon because you go one to the left for boron or you go one to the right for phosphorus and this is how your n or p type dope silicon and um, and we know that because they're right beside each other in the periodic table the chances are they fit into the position that they're replacing so is that a good enough reason to use these systems should we be looking at something different so in 2015, the dean of our university, so my boss, the person who determines whether I get promoted or not, came to me and said that they had looked at some molybdenum doped indium oxide and they wanted us to do some calculations to back up their experiments. So they're primarily a CVD group, so they've grown some samples by chemical vapor deposition. And um, so we started to look through the literature, and what we found was that people had considered that molybdenum was going in as molybdenum 6 plus onto the indium 3 plus site and that it would be donating about three electrons per dopant. So we did our study, we did density functional theory, we did some XPS uh, and we did some XFs and we showed that actually molybdenum is going in as molybdenum 4 plus which is a one electron donor. Um, but then we did some analysis of the CVD films in terms of looking at the mobility and carrier concentration and we saw something very unusual, that the molybdenum doped indium oxide was actually outperforming the tin doped indium oxide. And we were skeptical at first, and we were wondering whether the postdoc who'd grown the samples had made a mistake. So we shipped these samples up to our collaborators in the University of Liverpool, to Tim Veal's group. And we didn't tell him anything, we just said, can you measure these as well? And they came back with this diagram, which shows that yes, the in black, the molybdenum doped indium oxide were far better than the tin doped indium oxide. And in fact, some of the mobilities that they were recording were actually breaking the normal um, ionized impurity scattering limit. So actually performing better than we would have ever expected them to be able to perform. So this was quite puzzling at the time. And myself and Tim wrote a funding proposal to the UK funding body. And we got about 1.5 million to try and understand this. So we then decided to go back through the literature because there had been about 30 papers on molybdenum doped indium oxide. And if you actually analyze all of those papers, you saw that in every paper, they normally outperformed ITO. Um, and here we've plotted some of the metadata that we um, found in the literature and you can see that IMO is in red and ITO is in blue and at nearly all samples that either we have grown or people have um, reported in the literature you can see that the resistivity of the IMO is better than the ITO and the mobility of the ITO is much higher than the mobility of the ITO. So this poses a question. Both of these dopants are going in as one electron donors. So tin is four plus and molybdenum is four plus. So if they're both one electron donors, why is one behaving so differently than the other? So one thing to note about indium oxide is that it's actually a very unusual material in that it has a fundamental band gap that's about 0.8 of an electron volt lower than the optical band gap. And actually Aaron Walsh, who you guys had speaking to you a couple of weeks ago, was the first person to realize this back in 2008, when he showed that transitions from the valence bond maximum to the conduction minimum were actually not allowed by symmetry. And um, so the parity disallowed, but transitions from about 0.8 of an electron volt below the valence band to the conduction band is what you see when you measure the optical band gap. So when we measured our optical band gap experimentally for our IMO samples versus our ITO samples, what we found was that the IMO samples were actually way more transparent, especially into the IOR. So again, we're adding in one elect extra electron per dopant, but something is happening. And what is happening? This is the question. So we analyzed all of the films that we'd grown by um, they were, these were grown by AACVD, which is uh, aerosol-assisted chemical vapor deposition. And we could look at the plasma edge for IMO, and we showed that it was actually it begins much further into the IOR than for ITO. Um, 
And we also plotted a, a HACA figure of merit, which is the transmission to the power of 10 over the sheet resistance. And any way we plot this, IMO is far superior to ITO, even uh, especially when they're at the same thickness. So we started to think, what, what is going on? So one of the measurements that we did was we took, we plotted the optical band gap against the plasma energy. And we could fit the um, IMO data with a perfectly rigid conduction band effective mass of 0.22 uh, times the mass of the electron. But we could only plot the ITO data if we had an ever increasing um, effective mass going from 0.22 up as far as 0.4. So what that tells you is that as you dope with higher carrier concentrations, you're not affecting the band structure or the, the you're not affecting the conduction band minimum of IMO, but you are affecting the conduction band minimum of ITO. So this is where we came in. We did a load of calculations on the indium oxide crystal structure. And of course, it, it's known to crystallize in this lovely cubic Bixbyite structure. Um, there's two different types of indium. You have either, they're both six coordinates, so octahedral. Uh, one is the 8B position, which is a very regular octahedra. And the other is a 24D position, which is a very um, distorted octahedra. So again, there's a plot of formation energy of individual defects versus um, the Fermi energy, and this orange line represents the conduction band minimum. And what you can see is that when you put tin on an indium site, you end up with it acting as a very good dopant, which is why ITO is in most of the devices that we use um, in terms of thin film displays. Um, but molybdenum on the 24D site, is also a similarly good dopant. And molybdenum on an AP site is not a good dopant. In fact, its transition level occurs before the conduction band, meaning that it's a deep donor. So you have within, when you dope with molybdenum, you have two different things occurring. You have, when it goes in on the 24D site, it's an excellent dopant. When it goes in on the 8B site, it's not actually that good of a dopant. So, we had done some EXAFS analysis um, showing us the bond lengths around these um, individual dopants. And what we found is that when the system is not ionized, so when you're in this zero charge state, so basically you still have an electron associated with the, um, the dopant, that our average molybdenum to oxygen bond lengths are 2.12 and 2.13, which don't match very well with the experiment, which is 2.05. But when you ionize these defects, which is what you actually would expect to occur at around the conduction minimum, they are in the ionized charge state, not the neutral charge state, that actually you end up with bond lengths which are in excellent agreement with the experiment. So we were happy that we were getting a good description so we decided to plot the band structures of the um, different defects on the different sites. So if we go through it site by site, this is the host band structure. You have the very nice curvy conduction by minimum that you expect for indium oxide. For molybdenum on the 24D site, molybdenum goes in as a four plus cation. So you end up with it being formally D2. So two occupied D states, which actually appear in the middle of the band gap. And you have one unoccupied D state just above the conduction band minimum. And this is for the neutral charge state. For the 8B site, molybdenum actually goes in as molybdenum 3 plus. So you have three occupied D states in the middle of the band gap, making it formally D3. But then when you ionize these defect, i.e. you basically, you lose an electron from the defect and it goes off somewhere in the conduction band doing its uh, conducting, you end up with a stabilization of these two defect states downwards in energy and the destabilization of the um, unoccupied state upwards in energy. And we saw the same thing for the um, distorted structure for uh, the 8B site. Um, 
so the question is, what's happening? What is causing this stabilization when we go to this ionized defect state? So this puzzled us for a while until I was walking to give an undergraduate second year tutorial in crystal field splitting, and then it hit me. The thing that you learn as an undergraduate chemist you think you'll never use again, crystal field splitting, actually solved this for me. So here we have three molecular orbital diagrams overlaid on the valence band and the conduction band of um, indium oxide. So the valence band is in blue and the conduction band is in orange. So these are the, MO di are the molecular orbital diagrams for an MO6 octahedra. And you can see that when you have um, molybdenum on the 8B site here on the left in the Q equals zero um, neutral charge state, you end up with three um, non-bonding T2G states in the middle of the band gap, which is what we saw in our band structure. When we go to the 24D site, also in the neutral charge state, Q equals zero, you end up with a destabilization of one of the um, T2G states upwards in energy, and basically the electron falls off that and goes to the bottom of the conduction band. And you have a stabilization of two of the T2G states. And you get this stabilization because this is a disordered, or this is a, um, not a regular octahedron. This is already a distorted octahedron. So essentially you're getting a Jan Teller distortion. And in fact, when you go to the Q equals one plus charge state, you get a contraction in the bond lengths, which stabilizes this distortion even more, giving you driving your T2G states downwards in energy and driving this unoccupied state up in energy. Um, so we were very happy because we, we then thought we had now understood what was going on in our calculations. And then we decided, well, what is actually going on with the bonding at the conduction band minimum? So on the left, we have a band structure of the host. On the right, we have the band structure of the um, molybdenum on the 24D site in the plus one charge state. And we can see that when we look at the spin density associated with these two um, impurities in the middle of the band gap, these are occupied D electrons localized on the um, molybdenum. When we look at the unoccupied defect state here, again, this is an unoccupied d orbital localized on the molybdenum. But when we look at the spin density around the conduction mount minimum, we plot this electron density, you can see that it is localized on the tin on the oxygen site, but it is not present on the actual dopant. Whereas if we put tin in the same position, you find a large amount of density on the tin state. So what this tells us is when we stick molybdenum into the system, you do not get any interaction of the molybdenum states with the bottom of the conduction band, meaning that the bottom of the conduction band is untouched, whereas when you put tin in, you get a mixing of the tin S states with the indium S states, which is probably what is mediating the larger effective masses as you increase the amount of doping. So of course, up to this point, this is speculation from our exper or from our calculations. So we turned to my colleagues at um, Diamond, and we used hard X-ray photoelectron spectroscopy at IO9 um, to basically examine what's going on in the bulk of these systems, because hard X-rays, uh, hard XPS probes further into a material than surface XPS does. Um, and what we quickly found is that the experiment actually found the molybdenum 4D states in the middle of the band gap, as we had predicted. And then we did inverse photo emission spectroscopy at Liverpool to look at the, the unoccupied states in the conduction band. And we also did some XAS um, at the APS in America. And what we found is we found these unoccupied molybdenum D states in the conduction band minimum. So spectroscopically, we predicted that our model, or we showed that our model was right, and this is what happens when you stick molybdenum into the system. What HACSPES also allows us to do is you can actually zoom in on the occupation at the bottom of the conduction band. Um, and what we found from looking at the, the samples is that the ITO um, signal 
has a higher peak intensity, but is narrower than that of the IMO, which you could basically imagine the occupation at the bottom of the conduction band. The ITO is narrower because you basically have a much broader uh, effective mass, whereas your molybdenum dopants do not interact with the bottom of the conduction band, meaning you maintain that lower effective mass. So of course, our Dean was very happy that we'd explained his results, and he's very uh, interested in whether we could actually take these results forward and, and, and go to industry with them. So we carried out a number of durability tests. So the sheet resistance and transmission were analyzed over multiples of these tests. Now, obviously, I did not do these tests. These were all done in experiments, but we did tape tests, scratch tests, heat tests, and acid tests. And what we could see is that basically CVD grown molybdenum doped indium oxide basically is just as tough as ITO. So there should be no barriers to the widespread adoption of IMO as a superior replacement to ITO. So the kind of schematic of our finding is that when you dope indium oxide with um, molybdenum, you end up with two defect states in the middle of the band gap, and your donor state is very high in the conduction band minimum, meaning that it doesn't perturb the conduction band minimum. So no matter what the doping concentration, you maintain a low effective mass. Whereas when you dope with tin, you end up affecting the bottom of the conduction band, broadening it. And as you dope with a higher carrier concentration, you end up getting a higher effective mass, which lowers the mobility. So this transition metal doping maintains a higher mobility at higher carrier concentrations. So our conclusions for that part were that IMO is definitely superior to ITO. Thinner films of IMO can be used to replace ITO and give the exact same performance as thicker films of ITO, which is potentially game changing for industry because what it means is that you should be able to use half of the indium, meaning that this uh, problem of lack of indium could actually be halved. But not only does it do that, it gives us design principles for trying to find dopants for other transparent conducting oxides. So clearly the field would like to move away from indium-based oxides. Um, so if we could find a proper dopant for other TCOs that would increase their performance, bringing them more in line with doped indium oxide, then that would be fantastic. So what we know is that you want to transition metal dopant with a donor D state that does not hybridize with the host cation S states, and we want it to be a one electron donor, because if you have more electrons per donor, then you'll end up running into ionizer purity scattering issues. So the big grant that we had written was actually to find the best dopant for tin dioxide, because we were funded by a large glass company called Pilkington Glass, and they are interested in finding a new dopant for tin dioxide than their traditional dopant, which is fluorine. So this in um, molybdenum doped indium oxide work was published earlier on this year in Materials Horizons. If anyone's interested in the paper, it's available online and you can see these slides again from the, the video that you guys are taking. So how do we go about finding the best open for tin dioxide? So fluorine doped tin dioxide, FTO, or antimony doped tin dioxide, ATO, are very well known, but they normally have resistivities of the order of five by 10 to the minus four. And both of these dopants are actually self-limiting. So as you increase the carrier concentration of the dopant beyond a certain Fermi level, you end up seeing a reduction in performance. And this in FTO is caused by the formation of fluorine interstitials, and we demonstrated this in this paper in 2018. And then for ATO, you get a, a fall off because you have the formation of antimony 3 plus on the surface, and also when you have an antimony dopant near an oxygen vacancy, you get a trapping of charge. Um, Transform, transforming the antimony uh, from five plus to three plus and basically reducing the conductivity, which we also showed in this paper in 2018. So we started to think what transition metals could be put on the tin site that would donate one electron um, and maybe have D states that would be in the middle of the, um, or higher up in the conduction band. So we automatically looked at vanadium, niobium, and tantalum. And what we showed is that niobium is actually not a good dopant. Vanadium, you end up trapping charge on vanadium states in the middle of the band gap. 
But tantalum is actually an excellent dopant. It's a very low formation energy, similar to fluorine on an oxygen site. Um, and it injects an electron directly into the conduction band. When we have a look at the um, band structures of the defect states, you can see that the tantalum D states sit high above the conduction band minimum, again, not interacting with the conduction band minimum. And of course, we don't have any defect states in the middle of the band gap for this system because you have put A5 plus cation on A4 plus site. So everything from our calculation shows that this should actually be an excellent dopant. So again, we did a similar analysis than what to what we had done for the molybdenum. We looked at every single previous study of tantalum doped tin dioxide, and we also grew um, samples of tantalum doped tin dioxide by AACVD and compared them to antimony doped tin dioxide from uh, our lab as well. And what we found is that actually across the board, tantalum doped tin dioxide, which we call Tato, because the uh, my collaborators are very happy that because I'm Irish and I like potatoes that they could call this Tato, which is great. Um, but basically, Tato outperforms ATO in terms of mobilities and conductivities across the board. And in fact, some studies have shown that you could get up to mobilities of above 80. And in fact, there was a paper in scientific reports about three weeks ago from a Japanese group where they managed to get the mobilities of tantalum doped tin dioxide up to 130 which is world record breaking. And we've now emailed them, they're sending us their samples and my students, I have some experimental students as well. One of them is going to measure these samples using Haxpes and our normal characterization to understand why they're so good. So again, when we look at the transparency of the systems, what we find is that Tato has a much higher transparency in the IOR than um, either FTO or ATO. And this is very interesting because when you use these systems as electron transport layers in solar cells, you want to get rid of parasitic losses in the IOR. And by using these dopants and having a higher transparency in the IOR, you actually reduce these transparency losses. And recently somebody took our idea for doping of indium oxide and used zirconium as a dopant and used that in a perovskite solar cell and actually increased the efficiency significantly. So again, we can analyze the effective masses of the systems by doing an analysis of the um, hard XPS of our samples. And what we find is that on average, the effective mass of the tantalum doped tin dioxide is actually lower than the effective mass of the fluorine doped tin dioxide, basically proving our model from the uh, molybdenum doped indium oxide picture. So my conclusions for this section on the tantalum doped tin dioxide, Tato is a superior dopant to FTO and ATO in terms of mobilities and conductivities. It provides superior IOR transparency, which is of, of interest for a range of um, solar cell devices. Um, and we are basically trying to advertise this finding to the field because we believe that if people start using um, tantalum as a dopant in their um, photovoltaic devices that they will see a range of improvements. And this work was also published this year in Chemistry and Materials by my very talented ex-PhD student, Benjamin Williamson. So I have a range of acknowledgements because obviously we didn't do all of this work. We did a lot of it in collaboration with uh, very talented experimental groups. So Adam Jackson, who was my postdoc at UCL and is now a staff member at the Harwell site, um, who did all of the calculations on the ZNSP206 stuff. Winnie, who grew the samples with Rob Palgrave and then uh, grew powder samples and then gave them to Robin Perry and Ben Parrott to make their single crystals. Um, ben Williamson, who's now a postdoc at NTNU in Norway. Sanjay, who grew all of the CBD samples under the supervision of Professor Claire Carmalt and Professor Ivan Parkin at UCL. Um, the team at Liverpool working under um, Tim Veal, who did all of the uh, X-ray photoelectron spectroscopy characterization. The team at Pilkington NSG, who were very interested in our results and funded the work. And then the spectroscopists who did all of our analysis, Anna Ragutz at UCL, Tian Lin Lee at Diamond, who built the beamline, and Lewis Piper at Binghamton, who did some of the XAS measurements. 
Of course, we couldn't do any of these stuff without access to lots of supercomputers. So thanks to UCL, the MMM Hub, and the Materials Chemistry Consortium for giving us access to all of these machines. And I would like to thank you for your attention. I am happy to take any questions that you have.